I think it's always worth reflecting on how far we've come in prostate imaging in the last decade. And it was about 10 years ago that I was trying to set up the precision trial and recruiting investigators to take part and convincing patients to take part. And I was told quite clearly that the study would fail. I was told that MRI wouldn't work. And so I really feel like I've lived through this quote from this German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, that all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Secondly, it's violently opposed. And third, it's accepted as being self-evident. And whilst we've made a lot of progress over the last decade, I think there's a lot to be made. And the question is whether or not imaging without prostate biopsy can be the standard way which we diagnose prostate cancer and inform treatment paradigms. So certainly there's precedent for this. In the rest of urology, there are other cancers such as kidney, adrenal, testicular, which don't rely on a biopsy. Each of these has their own specific nuances for why we do that, but certainly there's precedent for this to happen already. Let's talk about the harms of biopsy, and this is something that people don't really discuss that often. So is it a really, you know, a big deal about a patient having a prostate biopsy? So we know there's a small risk of sepsis in the region of around 2%. And when we think about the number of biopsies being done around the world per year, with 1 million in Europe per year alone, that adds up. And there are a lot of patients who are being harmed, who need admissions for IV antibiotics. It costs a lot of money to manage these patients in ITU. Obviously, without biopsy, this would be completely avoided. We know biopsy is disliked by patients. It's an expensive resource in general. Imagine the amount of cost savings we could make that we could reinvest into the rest of the pathway. And we know from repeated biopsies after repeated biopsies over the last three decades, that biopsy itself doesn't necessarily characterize disease burden as well as we'd like. There are some other putative risks which I'll talk about. In fact, the concept that doing a prostate biopsy can release tumor cells into the bloodstream is quite controversial, but we'll present some evidence for that too. So when I speak to my patients in clinic and speak to prostate cancer support groups with patients, interestingly, the thing they tell me is that it wasn't necessarily the treatment or the treatment-related side effects, which was the worst part of the pathway. They often say that it was the biopsy in the first place. At that point in their pathway, there's something about it which they remember the most, and they really don't like it. And this was a validated questionnaire study, a sub-study of the PROTEC study in more than 1,000 patients completing validated questionnaires. And it showed that there were really quite problematic post-biopsy symptoms, and these really affected the patients separate to their prostate cancer diagnosis. And we know that biopsy itself, a needle-based technique where you're trying to sample a piece of the cancer in the tissue, isn't the best at identifying significant cancer. In fact, it misses cancer all the time. That's why when we have a patient who we investigate, very rarely are they discharged completely. They still have some PSA follow-up for the rest of their life. And PROMISE, which we'll talk about more in, in a moment, actually showed that 50%, that's 50%, 50, 50 of significant cancers were missed on trust biopsy alone. So something more controversial, there is actually some evidence that when you do a prostate biopsy, it releases circulating tumor cells into the bloodstream. And though there is definitely more evidence required to support this hypothesis, Certainly, you could imagine if there were circulating tumor cells that might explain differential outcomes in patients undergoing radical treatment. Why do some have recurrences when the margins were negative on a radical prostatectomy, whereas others are fine? And the question is, if you have a virtual biopsy pathway where there is no physical biopsy, would that lead to better patient outcomes? So let's talk about how good imaging actually is for the primary detection of prostate cancer. So I think it's worth talking a bit more about the PROMISE study. This was a multi-centre study in 11 UK sites with 576 men with clinical suspicion of prostate cancer who underwent a 1.5 TMRI. They then underwent a general anaesthetic. They were blinded to the MRI results. They had two procedures. The first was a 5 millimeter transperineal template biopsy. That means one biopsy every mill of tissue, so a 50 cc gland, 50 biopsies. The second biopsy was a 10 to 12 core truss biopsy. 
At the end of the study, the MRI results were unblinded and compared to the reference of the template biopsy, as was the truss biopsy. And one of the key findings was that MRI missed no Gleason 4 plus 3 or greater, i.e. potentially 100% sensitivity for Gleason 4 plus 3 or greater. And these are the cancers which I think we'll all agree probably need treatment. However, when we look at some of the limitations, MRI does have a low positive predictive value as explained by a previous speaker. And that's because of false positives where the MRI identifies changes that look like cancer that don't turn out to be cancer. So if we reflect on how PROMISE will relate to whether or not we can approach uh, an imaging-based diagnosis, the pros would be, yes, it detects all the Gleason 4 plus 3, but the cons would be nearly in half of patients who'd have a false positive diagnosis, and if you base treatment on that, there'd be a lot, a lot of unnecessary harm. And there is a small proportion of patients with Gleason 3 plus 4 missed. The question you'll all ask, of course, is when you see MRIs from other centres, you'll probably make a comment about the quality and how the standards might not be the same as those at your own centre. Um, so we did a systematic review to look at whether contemporary evidence supports that. And if we think about the PROMISE study, it's actually quite old now. Some of the patients were scanned in 2011 on a 1.5T scan, and when I look at the images, they're actually quite poor quality compared to what we see today. So after that, we did a meta-analysis of 42 studies which showed the negative predictive value of MRI was still in the 90s. And if you compare that to the same definition in PROMISE, it's actually performed better than what was seen in PROMISE. So what about if we combine information from more than one imaging modality? Will that help? So I wanted to talk about PSMA PET, and this study from the Australian group, the primary study, really helps inform how we might use PET in the primary diagnosis of patients. So this is a multi-centre Australian study in three sites with 291 men undergoing an MRI, followed by a limited pelvic PSMA PET and systematic and targeted biopsies. And one of the things I really like about PET when I look at the imaging is that the avidity of the tumour on the scan is directly associated with the aggressivity of the cancer and its Gleason score. So when we combine the imaging, the MRI and the PSMA PET, the sensitivity for significant cancer really improved up to 97% from 83 for MRI and 90 for PSMA PET. So combining the imaging would detect almost all of the Gleason 3 plus 4. And it's from studies like this that we can develop standardized scoring systems to help us understand how to use the information. And the primary scoring system is one which looks at the location of the tumor, as well as the characteristics of the tumour and the avidity to define how suspicious an area is. However, when you increase the sensitivity of a test when you combine them, that's often at the cost of worsening false positives, and the specificity for the combined approach was quite low. So, of course, if you were to rely just on the imaging with those false positives, this would lead to a lot of unnecessary treatment, but, of course, you can alter those thresholds at which you decide to do that. And one of the things uh, we did, I spent some time in Australia with Louise Emmert and Michael Hoffman, and we looked at the primary paper and the data using the PSMA PET and the MRIs and looked at how they might interact for us to determine a risk stratification system, which we call the P-score, which we published in JURAL this year. And it looks at the primary score on the PET in relation to the PIRAD score and assigns a certain risk for that patient and we found that a P-score of 5 detects clinically significant cancer in every case based on the primary study. Now that, of course, leads to potentially patients going straight to treatment without biopsy. And this is the infamous Meisner paper published in European Neurology. It certainly wasn't the first paper to report this, but probably the most notable because of the journal, in which patients underwent radical prostatectomy based on a highly suspicious MRI and PET, without a biopsy. All of the patients did, uh, were diagnosed with clinically significant cancer, but of course there'd be significant implications if there were patients who underwent unnecessary treatment. So I'll touch on active surveillance now. And as you can see from a range of the different entry criteria, and when we think about international guidelines, entry and follow-up in active surveillance is heavily based on prostate biopsy as things stand. 
And let me tell you, there's only one thing that patients and clinicians dislike more than prostate biopsy. Repeated prostate biopsies. And so this is a table from the PRIA study, which is an international protocol for active surveillance, which required annual protocol biopsies. And the light orange bar shows the compliance with that. You can see it's pretty low. Um, it's in the region of 20% for many of the years because patients simply don't like it. And in fact, we often find it hard to do studies which require regular protocol biopsies now because of this. So the challenge we've got with moving towards an imaging-based pathway and active surveillance is we're moving from something that's currently biopsy-heavy in almost all centres around the world. And I think we need to transition to biopsy light before we can consider biopsy-free. Let's give you some evidence for the biopsy light approach. So in our cohorts, we have just over 1,000 patients on MRI-led active surveillance. They enter with a concordant MRI and biopsy at baseline. They have a confirmatory MRI at one year and then often every two years. We have over 20 years of data. None of these patients have a confirmatory biopsy. They only have four cause biopsies, i.e. based on an MRI or PSA change. The majority of our cohort is Gleason 3 plus 3, but almost a third is Gleason 3 plus 4. And as you can see from the orange bar at the bottom, we actually include more patients with 3 plus 4 than 3 plus 3 now. So it's quite a high risk cohort compared to most published. We showed good compliance with this approach to active surveillance with 85% remaining on surveillance at three years and 72% at five years. And the rates of discontinuation and specifically the oncological outcomes, mortality and metastasis, compare quite similarly to those of standard active surveillance, but it's a far less burdensome approach and it's biopsy light. So the question is, can we go biopsy free? Well, if you look at the rest of the literature, the systematic review data, looking at MRI alone in active surveillance, the evidence hasn't really shown enough um, high enough operating performance to support a biopsy-free pathway at this moment. And some of the limitations relate to standardized ways of assessing change on MRI over time and quality of MRI scanning, which we've heard a lot about this morning. So we try to address those with the precise recommendations which document how you should report MRIs in active surveillance over time. And we published the version two guidelines this year in European Neurology. The last thing I wanted to mention was about whether or not we're actually trying to detect the right thing. So when you look at the MRI imaging, the visibility of the lesion is actually a strong determinant of prognosis. We know from studies which have looked at what genes are upregulated, a visible lesion has genes which are upregulated, which are genes that predict outcome and really prognosis. And I'll give you a few examples of how this is the case. So in our active surveillance cohort, which I showed you before, that red line represents the visible three plus fours. And you can see the prognosis, which on here is event-free survival, is quite different to the non-visible lesions. And here's this radical prostatectomy series from MSK. We have just under 1,500 patients treated with radical prostatectomy. They were followed up for 11 years. And you can see the red line, which is the MRI visible lesions, do worse for biochemical recurrence, metastatic disease, and prostate cancer-specific mortality. So if we treat what we see, will our patients do better? That's the question that this raises. So if I sum up, we've discussed a few pros and cons for a biopsy-free pathway. We know patients don't like prostate biopsies. We've talked about the inaccuracy and harm from needle-based biopsies. You could save a lot of resource by avoiding this. And imaging-based pathways could be the new cornerstone for clinically significant cancer definitions. And of course, we'd need a bit further evidence for that. And we have a precedent for other cancers where there is imaging-based diagnosis. Some of the cons, so I think they're reliant on high-quality imaging and experienced readers, and the question is whether this is generalizable to all other centers. There is a lack of high-volume data on this strategy at the moment, and combination strategies with different imaging tests are based primarily on a selected subset of patients, not on all. We know imaging in some centers can be quite expensive, 
the lack of pathology information, of course, which is currently used for treatment planning and decisions on adjuvant treatment can also be lacking. So we'd have to redefine that if we did an imaging-based approach. And of course, the two major ones, the risk of harms and treatment-related side effects from unnecessary treatment and the fact that prostate biopsy in general is a, a low morbidity procedure. So um, I'm hoping that we can make some advancements on this and in the next 10 years, maybe I'll speak about it again and we'll have a bit more data on it. Thank you very much.